Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Would you please welcome with the talk on Wei and Da Nang, Captain Richard Heyman. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nick. Good morning, everybody. Chao uh, Ong Ba Cao, which is, uh, uh, as my brother says, aloha in Vietnamese. It's used at any time of day or for any reason. And today I'm wearing my Mandarin coat as a, I'm trying to pretend to be a scholar. I only play one on TV, of course, but this is the style of coat that you would have seen the Vietnamese wearing in this part of Vietnam, especially. Where we, we're going tomorrow to Da Nang, which is a modern port city. Uh, we also then, some of us are going up to Hue, which is the, the former imperial capital and very much the uh, home of the elite and especially the academics and the intellectuals that were what's been called the dictatorship of the literati in former times in Vietnam and also similar in China, that those who could learn how to read and write were those who were given positions. And often the imperial exam given in the, the hall in Hue meant that young scholars who had been ruthlessly uh, coached for these exams uh, would master poetry, uh, literature, and then once they had been able to, by rote, copy this out and then repeat it properly, they were given uh, jobs to run economics, military, and things like that. Just like today where poets usually run those divisions in our country. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, but this, uh, I'll just show you some things. That perhaps some of you have been to this area, you'll know that this is where you see the most extreme examples of traditional Vietnamese culture, along with the most modern of the cities, Da Nang, uh, which is a major port and a very big city now. But uh, like Sa Saigon, it has uh, mushroomed with business and visitors and is uh, very much a, a skyscraper uh, vista in contrast to the little town of Hoi An, which is a world heritage uh, historic town, and then Hue, which is the remains of the old imperial capital. So I'm going to show you these places, and I'll show you some things you won't have time to see, or as uh, I always remember the phrase of uh, former Prime Minister Disraeli, that when I travel, I saw more than I remember, but I also remember more than I saw. And therefore, I'll show you what I think I remember seeing the last time I was here. Um, so we have uh, this part of Vietnam with, of course, we've come out of Ho Chi Minh, Saigon River, all the way up the coast. So we have a whole sea day to go up to Da Nang, the port. Hoi An and Hue are not deep water ports. We cannot get in there. But we're passing right along here, Kamran Bay, which was the largest of the military ports built by under the American administration. And then uh, when I came here in 1986 first, we went by there and the Soviet Navy was there lolling around on the beach instead of the American Navy. And I always remember when we came there, um, the Vietnamese would wave to us and say, Lieso, Lieso, Soviets. And I'd say, I'm, I'm an American Soviet. I'm not a Russian Soviet. But anyway, we will continue on up to Da Nang. This is where Vietnam is at its most narrow with only about 50 kilometers between the beaches and the mountains of Laos. And you can see the Mekong River is running right along through this very rough area. The Ho Chi Minh Trail went through the mountains like this. And then there's very sh uh, short and uh, fertile uh, plains along the coast that are where the, the, the towns are. Now, here's a closer look of Da Nang, which is in the curl of this, they call the Monkey Mountain Peninsula, which gives Da Nang great protection from uh, typhoons and the o open ocean, so it's a great natural harbor. Hoi An's down on the Tudo River, which is silted up, and Hue is up uh, further north, up the Perfume River, but again, not a seaport. These are ancient towns that uh, when ships were small and slow, they could paddle up to these ports, but now those, they are left behind as historical towns. The countryside is this is very dramatic, more so than down on the Mekong Delta or up in Hanoi region other than Halong Bay. A lot of resorts have been built in this area just because you have such beautiful beaches, access to the mountains. Then you have the lush lowland paddy fields, uh, still some water buffalo, though they have been increasingly replaced by what they call the iron buffalo. And so I was, uh, I was reading a few of the um, Vietnamese proverbs about buffaloes because they are the most um, cooperative of animals. They say they're even more uh, useful than a man's best friend being the dog. But a buffalo will carry things, work for you all your life, 
and then when it is getting uh, time for retirement, it is carefully taken off the market and chopped up for dinner. So it, and, and all the time, it does not complain. So the, the, one of the stories is the tiger comes up into the uh, buffalo and says, why are you working for those terrible humans? You're much bigger. you got big horns. You could easily uh, conquer the humans. When maybe we could work together on that. And the buffalo says, oh, no, no. Men, humans are very dangerous because they use the ultimate weapon called intelligence. And so the tiger comes up and uh, asks the man, said, why are you keeping control of this great beast? And the man said, that's because I'm smarter. And, I, and the tiger says, well, what do you use? I don't see anything. The man says, I will use my intelligence, but I have to go in the house to get it. And if you want to find out my secret, you have to get tied up so you don't eat the buffalo while I'm going to get my intelligence. And so the tiger says, oh, I guess that's reasonable. Ties, he lets himself be lashed to a pole. And then the man says, aha, now I can show you my intelligence. Starts hitting him over the head. See how smart I am? Anyway, there's a, there are other Vietnamese stories of, or rather proverbs. One is uh, the, the buffalo is the beginning of fortune, meaning if you don't have a buffalo, you can't grow rice and become prosperous. And also another one, a buffalo on a leash hate the buffalo who are out grazing freely, meaning those who are constricted envy those who are free. And another one is the late buffalo are left with only muddy water to drink, me meaning you be better be there on time, sort of like the restaurant downstairs. And so you have uh, this uh, agricultural culture that you'll see, especially as you go on the trip out to Hoi An or up to Hue, and uh, the rice growing, and here's some scarecrows. And uh, sometimes you'll see them out in the field, but the egrets, those snowy white egrets you see, they tend to ignore these if they don't move completely. But there's another uh, proverb in uh, Vietnamese, which is the, the murky waters fatten the egrets, which is a phrase meaning when there's political trouble in the country, um, let's say aggressive or predatory people do very well. But in uh, this neighborhood now, it's of course peaceful and there's uh, there's a lot of uh, life in the fields. This is a salt works, actually. And uh, as you go up into the mountains, though, it's suddenly very hilly. And this is the central highlands, which are vast and very rugged country. Now they're coursed with some quite a few roads, including one going all the way across Laos, which is going to join up across Cambodia, Thailand, and to Burma, what they call the Trans-Asian Highway, which will bring all of this, uh, let's say, the spreading concrete and commercialism of of all this part of Asia together, and hopefully the, the result of that will not only be economic benefit to the people, but finally put to rest all of the warfare that has plagued this part of the world. Up in these mountains, though, you can see that it's very deforested. A lot of it is very damaged, especially from the war when there was a lot of bombing and defoliation in that area. So if you read any of the guidebooks about going hiking in the Central Highlands, you have to, the, the warnings are always do not go off the established path because you may still fall victim to a landmine or there are poisons in the woods. And uh, it's been a great ecological disaster in this area now, slowly regrown. Now they have uh, national parks to try to preserve remnant life, uh, wildlife up in these mountains. They also have a lot of minority people. There's some 50 minority groups up in the mountains, which are the descendants of the original, what they call astral Asian uh, peoples, wh who are related to the aborigines of uh, Australia. Uh, but these people were famously torn as allies and enemies throughout the, the various wars, from Chinese, French, to the American, by the uh, forces allying with various of them, most famously the Hmong in Laos who were uh, allied with the Americans and then when the war was uh, at its finish, many of them became refugees. Now, when you go up in these mountains, it's very rugged, hard to get through. Uh, the the uh, Vietnamese government has a policy of protection of these minorities, but a lot of them have become assimilated over time. Uh, they, but they're not a lowland rice growers. They're often just vegetable f uh, farmers and then they grow uh, things like corn, which is, of course, an American uh, uh, crop that's come. This is a sugarcane cutter. Uh, but you can go up in these villages, and, of course, this is uh, the best place to be in an, uh, with an elephant is behind the elephant, right? so you don't get stepped on. But you have to watch your step. And a lot of the people live in very primitive housing up there, thatch, 
roofs, which uh, when there's heavy rains, they will um, sometimes get uh, washed through or knocked down, but they can easily put them back up. But they're more comfortable, they say, than a big concrete block with a solid roof. So you have some architecture which is unique to the Central Highlands. This area gets the most rainfall of any place in Vietnam. Some, some places get up to eight meters of rain a year, which is a great deluge that creates these rivers that pour out to sea. Some of the houses are particularly designed to resist the heavy rains, like this is a Ba people house up in the highlands. The people that live there are now a very mixed race. They have some of the lowland Vietnamese, but they are mixed between themselves. And then I believe this little kid maybe have a little French or uh, American uh, lineage. Uh, but these areas are considered uh, the most backward and poor of all of Vietnam, particularly in contrast to the big cities that are growing so much. Many of the men go down to the cities to work, and then they come up in the season, depending on their, their labor, to take attend mountain fields. And unfortunately, a lot of them are still smoking opium and dealing in illegal smuggling across to the other countries. Outside of Da Nang, there's another um, culture that is, predates the Vietnamese. It's called the uh, Tom culture, which was a nation that was uh, influenced from India and had an Indic Sanskrit-based script and built temples like these, uh, similar to in uh, Angkor Wat or further to the west of here. This is a site that's only about 40 kilometers outside of Da Nang, uh, Mison, which has these elaborate stone remnants of a very extensive temple complex. Uh, it has a ceremonial square with uh, passages, meditation halls, stele, but much of it was badly damaged when uh, B-52 bombers and artillery uh, bombarded the areas of free fire zone. So some of the main halls that were well documented prior to that war are now just ruins. Uh, outside and further south of Mison, here's one of the few examples of one that is undamaged. And you can see the, the kind of Hindu style of stacking of the uh, layers of cosmology of this kind of a tower. Uh, on the roads, you still see markers from the Kham Empire. Uh, th this group fought with the Vietnamese, who were only in the North Red River Valley prior. And they, they at one point, these people came up and conquered Hanoi about a 1,000 years ago. But then the, when the Chinese took North Vietnam, they came down with the Vietnamese and conquered the Kham and dispersed them in the hills. But they say there's about 200,000 Vietnamese that have Kham uh, lineage. And then there was also some that went off to sea and populated parts of Malaysia down to Borneo. And so in the long history of uh, the troubles of Asia, this is another empire that fell and was dispersed. But they left some of these monuments. This is the Lingam, or the Holy Shiva Tower of the temple complex. And uh, this is one that remains on site as the fertility worship. But most of the sculptures were fortunately removed to be put in the Kham Museum in Da Nang. So those of you who are in town can go to this museum and see some of the relics from the finer sculptures that were removed before the damage was done to the main site. These include some of the, the bas reliefs of their history. Their, they were actually seafaring people. And they used to trade from central Vietnam to uh, Canton and China, and then all the way down to, the, to Borneo and to the Philippines. So this is part of the ancient sea routes that Asia had well before the Europeans came with other ships. But you can see in some of this uh, sculpture that's much more, uh, has an Indian heritage. Uh, they're elephants, they're dancing uh, warriors. You note that this guy has a mustache and a hairdo that is si more similar to uh, India and they say there's even Greek influence in some of the uh, uh, finer details compared to being a Chinese-based culture. Here's another temple warrior. And then uh, dancing multi-armed uh, maidens. Here's the dancing maidens, very similar to an Indian-style uh, temple dancer, which you can see through India pretty much. Though, uh, wears a uh, crown uh, bonnet more like what we saw in Thailand. So this is an ancient uh, culture that remains in Vietnam, though it's pretty much replaced by the, the Vietnam that we know today. This lingam, the major one from one of the main temples that was destroyed, was brought to the Kham Museum. But you notice it has Shiva's lingam, but it also has his consort's breasts uh, there. Now, some Hindu scholars, especially in India, have complained that most Westerners find these things to be sexual imagery. But uh, it's kind of obvious to some of us that have some training in this 
Uh, but uh, I was reading, and a Hindu scholar said that they object to this uh, consideration of their culture to be purely erotic. And he said, it's not any different than a church steeple or other symbols in religion. But uh, Da Nang is now a very big city. And it, it's along its Great Bay. It, it has uh, some markets and some modern Vietnamese culture. But it's, uh, it's not the historic site that we are really landing here for, we, to go to Hue and to Hue, Na, Hue An. Now, at this point, I want to make a note about uh, the, um, the script. You've noticed that since we've come from uh, Chinese Singapore to Thailand with its Sanskrit-based writing, uh, if you've seen Cambodian, it's also a Sanskrit-based script. And then now we're in Vietnam, and you see it's all this uh, curious Roman letters. Well, this was an invention, or rather an adaption, of the vocal vocalized phonetic Vietnamese put into Roman letters uh, and developed by a Jesuit priest, uh, Alexander de Rode, who was uh, expelled from Japan in the mid-1700s. And he came to Vietnam to set up a Jesuit uh, academy in Hoi An, actually. And he felt that Christianity would never be easily learned by the masses if it was in Chinese characters, because less than 1% of the Vietnamese would learn Chinese characters. And so he developed this script, which is used to this day. And it has these diacritical marks for the tones. There are six tones in Vietnamese, so that uh, everyone has a, a different uh, vocalization, a high, low, rising, falling, flat. So it's da nang. And if you start to speak uh, Vietnamese, it gets uh, quite difficult, because we don't really have that kind of a vocalese that'll change the meaning of, of, a, of a word. Now, when I was in uh, university, though, uh, the linguist Noam Chomsky came to my college and said, in all these languages, there are phonetic uh, intonations that change the meaning, but we, we don't know that, in our, in, particularly in English. And also, he said, a double negative is often a positive, but a double positive never makes a negative. And so one guy in the back of the class from the Bronx went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, br I brought with me. Uh, my favorite little book, which is, I can't see it up here, but it's called Easy Vietnamese. Now, that's sort of a conundrum right there. Uh, but this was handed out to the GIs as they came to Vietnam. And on the back of it, it has the phrases that we all need to learn if we're going to be here, especially when you're on tour. Dong bai, stop. Dong lai, halt. Aldo, who's there? Show your pass. Hong Di, surrender. Vong Sang Xiong, throw up your arms. And Dong So Goi through. don't try any tricks. So this is what your guides are saying to us before they smile and return to English. But anyway, it's a very, uh, this has made Vietnam somewhat distinct in East Asia because the, the Vietnamese, other than a few scholars, will not learn Chinese characters. And so you'll see them in the temples of, at Hue where there's a lot of Chinese and they have no idea what it says. Uh, so that made Vietnam sort of nationalistically different from particularly China, the rest of uh, Chinese character using nations like Japan. Uh, Korea did the same thing, made a phonetic alphabet. But this meant that the majority of Vietnamese can read and write, whereas otherwise they'd have the same difficulty as uh, other people with their language. Anyway, so Da Nang is right here in this great bay, natural harbor. And it is a vast city. So you can get around. It has a lot of new districts. The main uh, places of interest are along the promenades in the main bay and the shopping districts. Uh, you can take a taxi around, see some of these places. But it, it's not a concentrated walking town, even as much as Saigon. It's very spread out. There are a couple of main streets. We will be docking along in this part of the port. But if you can take a taxi and go over to the beaches, which are beautiful, and then go to, this is a park, the Monkey Mountain area. There's another Marble Mountain area. But it is not very, uh, let's say, uh, photogenic as a city. It looks like many other modernized cities in Asia. Uh, it's you know, comfortable in the night when you go out to the night markets and get some cool uh, air. Uh, this is the French Catholic cath Cathedral. Now, this area was the, was the area where the missionaries first came, actually to Hoi An and then Da Nang. And so there has been a large Catholic population in Da Nang in particular. 
But you can see still the same kind of street life with the motopeds and the markets and uh, the different life as it is. And I'm going to pause here with, uh, to, to uh, tell you another story about the um, about the, uh, the the village outside of Da Nang. And because the mar the market is booming, they decided they were going to grow ducks because they were getting a high price at the new restaurants in town. And so the the village committee went to the neighboring village that that grew ducks and got some advice, and they went.